Okay, here we go. So this is what happens when you teach on spiritual warfare. Just nothing works. Nothing, nothing works properly, right? That's just, those are the little micro things that you see. But yeah, we had Ferguson Verish out here right before everybody's showing up. We had Chick-fil-A showing up at 345. As I said to some people, if you get sick, it's all Chick-fil-A's fault. So I'm just kidding. Don't get sick. Don't get sick. Um, but with that, I'm going to open us up in prayer and then just kind of give us a general overview of where we're going over the next seven weeks. The reason why seven instead of six is because we have overflow October 11th. And so we're all downtown for overflow. And so instead of just doing a six week series and then having that extra week, we all know I'm going to go long. I'm going to need seven anyways. If I say seven, we need nine. So we're just going to basically shoot for seven overflow, then come back and finish out the next semester after that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and then let's get into it. Heavenly Father, we just come before you, Lord, and we thank you so much for this wonderful day that you've given us. And Father, in the midst of everything that's going on as we dive into this topic on spiritual warfare, Lord, my prayer for us is that we would focus on you more. Our attention would turn to you more. We would continue to look at where we are being attacked, but Father, in the midst of that, we won't fixate upon the attacks. We would fixate upon your hope your love, your promises, your presence. And so, Father, would you just guide us through this message? Lord, we know that when we go through a series like this and we become uh, much more aware of what's going on, Lord, we know that the enemy does attack. And so would you just put a hedge of protection around us in this room today? And would you guide our time? And would you allow the Holy Spirit to do the convicting? May we enter your word open and may we enter your word willing to obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, hopefully you got the notes. As you know, I I like to put together detailed notes. That's kind of the entirety of it. I also like it in case you miss, you can catch up. And then in addition, we're trying something new this year. So I'm mic'd up. I'm going to try to record it, especially for the workers in the back. A lot of the workers are working in the back. And I just wanted to make sure that if they wanted this message, it was going to be available to them. And so we're going to try and record it. We'll try and put it out there. So if you do miss a week, Hopefully it's available in that capacity. I don't know. We've never done it. We just got literally everything plugged in this week. So let's see if it works. So that's the route we're going to go. So spiritual warfare, seven weeks over this. And again, I just want to make sure that we keep that balance in here, that as we get ready to go into this, we know that our fixation must be on God above all else. It's always hard to go in a topic on spiritual warfare because I don't want to give Satan more conversation than he deserves. And so we're going to try to make sure that we balance that. And so our fixation, our focus, everything that we do must circle back and must come back to, but what does God have to say for us? How does he want us to handle this? What does his word say about this? And then what is the hope and what is the action plan in the midst of this? And so that's kind of what we're going to look at. And as we go through this, we're going to just kind of start off with who is the enemy? Know your enemy. And then we're going to take it into just kind of looking at some different aspects. We'll look at the fall and just how that started. And then, like I said, I just felt like the Lord was leading me to have this um, focused lesson on the home, just really moving it into the home. And so we'll start looking at different homes and the way in which the enemy attacked. And so while we'll look at the fall in general, we'll circle back and we'll look at the fall as it was a home of Adam and Eve. And then we're going to look at the home of Abraham and Sarah. We're going to look at the home of Job. And then we're going to look at the home of some of the ones, right? Like Paul, Even though he was a home of one, he was still very much afflicted and attacked. And so we're just going to walk through this and we're going to look at how the enemy attacks. And in many ways, scripture gives him names and that's kind of how we will try to track some things. When you look at the names of him, adversary, accuser, then you know some of the ways in which he attacks. And so we're going to look at that and we're going to go through the fiery darts. Just how does he attack us? And so you'll start latching on to some of those fiery darts and recognizing those are the areas in which he attacks you. What are some of the tools and weapons that he most utilizes, utilizes to attack us? And once we identify those things, and I bet most of us know, but it's much more readily, how do we withstand the schemes of the evil one? Because the fact of the matter is scripture tells us we are at war. That's Ephesians 6, 12. We are at war. And if we don't wake up every day with some sense that we are at war, then we let things happen to us and we get frustrated and angry and caught in the midst of it before all of a sudden we snap out of it and realize the enemy's overplayed his hand in it. And so if we just kind of understand Ephesians 6, 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of darkness 
against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. That's where this is. It's not against flesh and blood. It is, there is a spiritual war that is going on, and God has a lot to say. He teaches us. He warns us. One of the theme verses that you're going to hear over and over and over comes out of 2 Corinthians 2.11, for we are not ignorant of Satan's schemes. We mustn't be ignorant of Satan's schemes. And so we're going to work on knowing God, knowing the enemy, and knowing ourselves. But we've got to make sure we know God in the midst of it. And that's really critical for where we're going today. There's a warning that C.S. Lewis gives us, and I love this warning. He says, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence, and the other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased with both errors. So wherever we land, if we don't give him enough, if we say he doesn't exist, or if we go all the way and swing that pendulum that we give him too much, there's too much fixation, too much on him, and, and then we can fall in that balance of, it, it can get crazy. Animism falls in that balance of giving too much to the enemy. Everything, like my shoes are untied, Satan, right? There's, there's, no, there's no more OJ, Satan, right? So there's a lot of times, like there would be a lot of times just when we were kind of traversing through, through the villages, something went wrong, they'd be like, Satan. I'm like, I don't think so. You know, felt like I was in home improvement. I don't think so, Tim. And so on the other side of it, though, we can say he doesn't exist. And that's just as great as a fallacy. And so we've got to find that balance. If you want to kind of know where Christians stand, I looked up a George, uh, I looked up a Barna survey. And the Barna survey, and this was only polling Christians. And so I find that these numbers are fairly staggering because of how focused it was on just Christians and this is what Christians had to say. 40% of Christians, according to the survey, say that Satan is not a real living being, but a symbol of evil. 40%. 20% somewhat agreed with that. So you're looking at 60% that on some base level don't truly recognize Satan as a real living being, but simply either a force or just a symbol of something. And 8% were just, they don't know. There wasn't enough information, they, they said. So if you're looking at that, that's 68% that aren't willing to look at Satan as a real living being, even though scripture is very clear in what it has to say. But this is what I found very interesting. So it's saying here that 68% aren't really either strongly disagree or very uncertain about the existence of Satan. And yet... 64% would say they believe a person can be under demonic influence. That was a clear contradiction. I was just looking at that. I'm like, we got some confused people. We got some confused people. We got to clear that up with getting into the scriptures. And here's the root of the problem. Because it went on to, to start asking more questions about what they believed about the Bible and what it believed about God. And so through that survey, this is the root problem. And this is why I believe this is the problem where we're in right now. Only 55% of Christians that were surveyed, 55% of Christians that were surveyed believe that the Bible was the inerrant word of God. It doesn't take a lot to figure out, as we're going to dissect the father of lies, that if you can undermine the word and undermine the truth, then you can undermine everything else. And he's quite happy if you don't believe he exists. Only 55% See the Bible as the inerrant word of God. And then this was the other disconcerting thing, but it shouldn't surprise us if, if only 55% are willing to hold on to the entirety of the scriptures as God's inerrant word. Only 51% held to a biblical view of God as all-powerful and the all-knowing creator. Half. Half of those surveyed. Half of, the, half of the Christians surveyed. That number was 73% in 1991. So we are at 51% hold to the biblical view that God is the all-powerful, all-knowing creator. And 44%, and this is just reading into this, this is where most everybody was just, it was kind of staggering. 44% do not believe that Jesus lived a sinless life. That puts him on par as just, they think that he was just a morally good person. He was a good teacher. But we got to say that he was fully God, fully man, the son of God who came to this world and lived a sinless life so that he could lay down his life for us. How do you say that I'm a Christian and not believe in the word of God 
not believe that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, creator of the world? And how can you believe in a Savior that was not perfect? We're flawed from the start. And so if we already believe that about our God, where are we going to be with Satan? We're going to be all over the map. So that's what we've got to shore up. And that's why I say, know your enemy, know your God. And we did a very long and lengthy study last semester going through the attributes of God. So I have all those notes if you ever want to walk through that. But, and so we're just going to kind of make sure that we circle back to that as it's relevant in here. But, but we did a very lengthy, incommunicable, communicable attributes of God and making, make, making sure that we understand who God is. And so we come back to D.L. Moody saying God gave, that, that D.L. Moody gave two reasons for believing the devil. One is the Bible teaches it, meaning God tells us there's a devil, so automatically that's all we need. That should be enough. But the second thing I like that D.L. Moody says, and he says, and I know that I've done business with him. I like that quote because we all know. We all know. Having conversations with people. Having conversations with those that are involved, involved in like difficult cases, read the news, just look at what's going on even in our community right now with the Trumbull case, and it doesn't take a whole lot to go, there is evil in this world. Where does evil come from? How do we get to that place? And J.I. Packer says, he should be taken seriously for malice and cunning make him fearsome, yet not so seriously as to provoke abject terror of him. For he is a beaten enemy, Satan is stronger than we are, but Christ has triumphed over Satan. And Christians will triumph over him too if they resist him with the resources that Christ supplies. The one who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And that's the balance. That's where we sit. We come to a place where we recognize the existence of Satan. We know that he has some power, but we know that he is a defeated enemy. We know these things, so we got to keep that in check. We can't give him more. And so when we're in here, what does it mean that I want to make sure that we have a balanced conversation? Well, simply just look at scriptures. Look at the allocation of scripture to Satan himself or even just demonic forces, the demons, what's going on. And it's very interesting, especially as you start kind of taking a survey of the Old Testament and a survey of the New Testament and really looking at how much of scripture was actually given to us about Satan and the demonic activity around us. If you just look at the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, if you just look at the first five books of the Bible, Satan's never mentioned by name in that. And basically the, 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 the aspect of coming to the conversation of Satan, meaning serpent, sons of God, these types of things, in the Pentateuch it, three times. You would think that there's a lot more mention of demonic activity, much more. Now you can see behind the scenes, and we'll unpack some of those things, but the direct statements given to calling out you know, the enemy is only three times. The only three times you see it is Genesis 3, the fall, Genesis 6, the flood, and Deuteronomy 32, 17, false religion. So the fall, the flood, and false religion. And Deuteronomy 32, 17 is where it says that they sacrifice to demons. That, that wasn't building an altar. Those were very horrible sacrificial things a lot of times involving pagan rituals that were human sacrifice to demons. And so those are the only three instances in the five, first five books of the Bible. And so I want to be careful. And that's why I also have a hard time with music that will almost give way more attention to Satan than it will Jesus. For example, the, one of the songs that's out right now, The Devil's Got a Hold of Me. We understand what it's saying. That's good. But literally you have people singing over and over and over again, The Devil's Got a Hold of Me. The Devil's Got a Hold of Me. I just have a problem with that. 23 times it says devil or alludes to devil, but only five times does it have anything to say about Jesus or alluding to Jesus. I think we just have to be careful in how we do that. Let's not give him more attention than he deserves. Our focus must be on God himself first and foremost. Why? Because God is the central. He is central of the story. He is the meta narrative of the story. It is all about God. It's not about the enemy. It's not about man. It is about God and what he has done. It is about him recovering what was lost in the garden. It is about him pursuing his creation, 
knowing that he gave us free will, knowing that we would fall, knowing that we would make mistakes. Our sovereign God, who is sovereign over all, knew these things and yet still pursued us. And so the central story is God's plan of salvation. If you're trying to summarize what is this book, tell me about it is God's plan of salvation. God created, man fell. You got these apexes, right? Four of them. God's creation, the fall of man, and then you've got redemption. That runs the rest from Genesis 3 on. That runs the rest of the course. And then we get to the first advent. We've got redemption. This is where it takes place. Jesus came. Jesus gave his life. And then the last apex is restoration, meaning that we will be restored one day. So you have a God who is sovereignly over all, who created all. And, and we get in Genesis 1 and 2, we get the creation account. And then we finish up in Revelation 21, 22 with the new creation account. Everything in between is God's pursuit of us. That's the story. That's what we must stay focused upon. We can't lose track in the midst of this. We got to understand that the law was given to us to reveal the sinful nature of us, but it was a foreshadowing of the grace of God to come. And he used the, the atoning sacrificial system of animals to say there is the prophecy of the Messiah to come. Who is that? The one who will redeem us. And then it is fulfilled. It ushers in the complete fulfillment of the new covenant of the redemption that came through the Messiah. That's what we have to focus on. In the midst of this, we understand that from Genesis 3 all the way through, there is this picture of the war that is taking place for the soul of our hearts, the soul of our minds, and ultimately our souls in general. And the enemy would love to take us along the way. But here's the thing. And I love the adage, but we've read the book, we know how the story ends. So in the midst of all of this, we understand that we sit in hope. In the midst of all of this, we know how the story ends. We've read the end of the story. We know that in the end of this, that the enemy is going to be cast into the lake of fire. We know there's the first advent, the proto-evangelism. Evangelism, it was even the first gospel was even preached in Genesis 3.15. It says, he will strike your head and you'll strike his heel. The Messiah will come. So in Genesis 3.15, the promised Messiah was already told that victory's coming. And then after that, we get to 1 Corinthians 15, 52a through 57. And then we see the second advent. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will raise incorruptible and we will be changed. For this corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal body must be clothed with immortality. When this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that was written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory? Where death is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have victory. We walk from victory. We walk in victory. But there's this war that's still taking place. There's a skirmish that's still taking place. And how do we understand this? Because Matthew tells us that he will be cast into the lake of fire. We know the fate of Satan and his demons. We know the fate. We know the fate of those who will reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We know the fate, but we know the hope of those who call on the name of, the, of Jesus will be saved. And what's fascinating is just understanding is there is actually more. Because some people will say, well, well, because of the power of the cross and the dismantling, as it tells us, that, that, that the power of Satan was dismantled at the cross, then Satan is done. Well, yes, in regards to it was fully dismantled because the hope of the one came to bring in and usher salvation has been accomplished and we can fully and wholly be redeemed and restored. And so his power in that regard is done, but he's still very much at work. And take into account that beginning in Acts and then through Paul, through James, through Peter, there's a ramping up of conversations about Satan. You go through the Old Testament, you get pieces. There's more discussion about Satan and demons and demonic activity, and the work against the church, the bride of Christ, there's more discussion, there's more scripture allocated towards what was going on in the new covenant. And we live in the new covenant. So it very much means that there is an active evil being in this world, and he has a name. His name is Satan. And so what do we do? Well, I believe we start in the beginning. Let's just start. If we're gonna if we're gonna be able to battle against the evil one, then we gotta know him a little bit. We gotta know him a little bit because by knowing him, we can understand his tactics. 
Just the same as understanding our great God by his attributes, we can understand who the enemy is by his formation, the origin, what does this look like. Let's get a healthy perspective on who he is and who he's not. And then that'll help us, as scripture says, resist him and stand firm in the faith. So if we start in the beginning, what do we have? Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God. Elohim. God created the heavens and the earth. In other words, God created everything. There was nothing that pre-existed God. God existed alone. Therefore, there is one God. We know this. We say this, but we got to make sure that we understand this. Because Genesis 131 says, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. God saw all all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. Okay, because the question comes, we go through the Genesis account, and we see the creation account. God created the heavens and earth, and then we get the six-day account. We get the literal six-day account of the creation of God created all things. Who was involved in all things? Who was in the heavens? The angels. The heavenly hosts. Those bringing glory to God, right? So God created all things because what we're sitting here with is trying to really, in some sense, find the chronology in which Satan fell because we go from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, which reiterates Genesis 1, and then we get to Genesis 3 and there's Adam and Eve in the garden, and we'll walk through this way more next week, but there's Adam and Eve in the garden who's already there. The serpent the one who will be identified as Satan. So when did the fall occur? If we got six days in the creation account, what does this look like? So how did this happen? When did this take place? Well, we see the six creation, six day creation account of what well, we have, but somewhere in there, where, where do we land with the heavens? And here's why this is important. And here's why I think this kind of helps us understand that six day literal account of what we have, because it even says that before the earth was created, all the angels, the sons of God were praising God for his creation during that time frame. Job 38, four through seven, where were you when I established the earth? Tell me if you have understanding who fixed its dimensions. Certainly, you know, Who stretched a measuring line across it? What supports its foundations? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? So when God was creating the earth, the angels already existed. He'd already created them. Because they are singing and they are are glorifying God for the creation of the earth. Who was there at the laying of the foundation when the morning star, and that's going to be a name that we're going to look at, the morning star sang. That's the angelic beings. Who was it? The sons of God shouted for glory. That's going to be important when we understand uh, what took place in the time of Noah, the sons of God. Who are these people? So th- this is all very important of understanding morning stars sang, sons of God shouted. The angels, the heavenly host were there at the foundations of the earth singing glory to God and praising him. So somewhere in that timeline, and clearly it's fuzzy, because Scripture is, doesn't give us much more than that in the timeline of when did Satan fall? I don't know, but it was clearly that he was there praising because he was a created being, created good. There was still praising happening at the foundations of the earth. But what we do understand from this is that Satan is a created being. He's not a god. We must not attribute God-like status to Satan, meaning he's powerful, not all-powerful. He's knowing, he's not omniscient. He's not reading your thoughts. He can't do that. He's a master observer, but he's not reading your thoughts. He can send demonic influence, follow messenger. Messengers speak into the ear of, but he's not omniscient, or he would already fully have understood his fate. He would have known what was going to happen. He is a created being. He's a fallen angel. Why this matters is because when you look at the name of Satan, the name means adversary. It means one who opposes. 
So the name Satan means adversary, one who opposes. And so what happens is that sometimes there's a fallacy thinking that because he's Satan, because he's there in the beginning, and not the very beginning, but because he's there pretty early on, and because he's so powerful that he must be on some sort of equal footing with God or God would have eradicated him already. And this fallacy is known as dualism. Dualism is that there are equal and opposing forces battling against one another. And it's amazing because if we can sit here and look at saying Christians, 68% don't even believe that the devil exists, then how many of those that do believe he exists believe in some capacity to the unhealthy level that he has way more power and ability than we give him? I would say it's many. I would say it's a lot more after that that are remaining on just even the scale. And if half of us truly believe this is the errant, errant word of God, then we're just making stuff up. And if you go to all these other places all over the world, very much Satan gets way more traction than he should, especially in cultures of animism, ancestral worship, right? Especially in places like that, he becomes this equal and opposing. You get into Hinduism and they're all up there except Brahma. Brahma is over. So all these equal and opposing, and they would just put him in there in the same conversation. They would just put Jesus in there. And so if you're going to look at the globe itself, The world is looking at Satan as much more, much more opposing than he really is. And we know where that's going to lead us to. They are, they're not. Here's how I kind of liken this. They're not, they're, they're, they're not. I kind of liken the battle between God and Satan like this. Several of us uh, dads are, we decided to coach our, our, our son's tackle football team. And so we were just doing conditioning practices during the summertime, just really get them out of the couch, uh, get them out of the house and off the couch. So we just want to get them out. It was hot. But one of the cool things we did, we did this little conditioning camp with them. But one of the things we did at the very end was we did a father's and son's flag football game. It wasn't really our idea, but the boys were super excited and talked a whole lot of smack. But it was a father-son football game. And we're standing around going like, how bad do we hurt them? Right? We're just kind of looking around like, they're talking smack. They clearly need to be put in their place. But how much are we just going to let them participate and we're just trying not to tear hammies along the way, right? We're just going, hey, we're definitely going to try to mess with them a little bit, but let's also understand where we're at in life, and we got to be a little more careful. You know, one feisty run, and that's it. That's nine months. That's nine months of soft tissue. So, but realistically, we obliterated them, and it was kind of fun. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, because they talk so much smack. But this is really where I liken the battle. It's not much of a battle. It was not much of a battle between the creator of all and a subject, a created being. Whatever happens, he allows it to happen. That's going to be something we're going to wrestle with. But whatever happens, it's because our sovereign God allows it to happen. The existence of Satan, he allows it to happen. The power of Satan, he allows it to happen. But the father is in full control. The father has the power. The father is over all things. And the father has already said how the end is going to be done. The end is going to be accomplished. The end is already written. And so we must understand that there is one God. 1 John 4, 4, you are from God, little children, and you have conquered them because the one who is in you is greater than the one in the world. Obviously, the one in the world is Satan. Isaiah 45, 45, 5, I am the Lord. There is no other. There is no God but me. 1 Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God, one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. God alone is God. God alone is supreme. God alone, alone is omnipotent, omniscient, all of those things. God alone is in control. God alone is sovereign. God alone is good. God alone is love. God alone is truth. God alone is wisdom. We have to make sure that we rest in those attributes of God because only God assumes those attributes perfectly. Nothing else does. Surely not Satan. Satan is simply a fallen angel who believes himself a deity. He masquerades as a deity, but he's a fallen angel. And all those that rebelled with him are simply fallen angels also. This is, and there has been some 
debate, but I don't think there's much debate, on Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. Ezekiel 28, 12 through 17. Some say it's just simply looking at the king of Tyre. Some say Isaiah is just looking at the king of Babylon. But I just think there's too much in this that goes way beyond just what an earthly king, what you would say about an earthly king. And so I think it's twofold. It's, it's, it's a yes and a yes. But most commentators would say that Ezekiel and Isaiah, where they land in this, is that this is, this is talking about the fall of Satan. And so in Ezekiel 28, 12 through 17, we see what this origin looked like. Son of man, lament for the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the Lord God says. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every kind of precious stone covered you. Cornelian, sure. Topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, lapis, lazuli, turquoise, and emerald. If I said anything's wrong, I'm sorry. Your mountings and settings were crafted in gold. They were prepared on the day you were created. You were an anointed guardian cherub, for I had anointed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked among the fiery stones. From the day you were created, you were blameless in your ways until wickedness was found in you. Through the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. And you sinned, so I expelled you in disgrace from the mountain of God and banished you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud because of your beauty, and for the sake of your splendor, you corrupted your wisdom, so I threw you down to the ground. I made you a spectacle before the kings. That created being, many commentators believe, was Satan. And he was cast out. And so there he was. And he was a guardian cherub. Beauty. I mean, God made him incredible. And it says you were perfect until you sinned. So, so again, we can't get into this aspect of dualism. dualism. We can't get into this aspect like Mormonism tries to somehow say that, that Jesus and Satan are brothers. You know, there's none of that. He was a, an angel, a guardian cherub, anointed. And he was getting a prestigious place positioned with a purpose and it was to serve God almighty and bring him glory and to lead out in the other angels and what God was going to do. But yet in his pride, he wanted to be like God. Hence the way that he's going to come after Adam and Eve with that same verbiage. He wanted worship and he sinned and he became puffed up. And so God expelled him. God expelled him even so quickly. This is what Jesus mentions in Luke 10, 18. Jesus says to him, I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. It wasn't much of a battle. It wasn't much of a conflict. Isaiah 14 continues on. So let's make sure we get to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. And this is where we get the name for Lucifer. Shining morning star. Some translations will take that as Lucifer. We really get the name Lucifer a lot of times from John Milton's Paradise Lost. That's really where the name of Lucifer really started becoming more coined. Um, but that morning star was this idea of Lucifer. And so that's really where we get the idea. Scripture doesn't actually address the name as Lucifer. We get shining morning star. And so that's kind of where they come up with the name Lucifer. He says, shining morning star, how you have fallen from the heavens. You destroyer of nations. You have been cut down to the ground. You said to yourself, I will ascend to the heavens. I will set my throne above the stars, above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of God's assembly in the remotest parts of the north. I will ascend above the highest clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol into the deepest regions of the pit. Pride. The same thing we all struggle with, and one of the same things he uses against us was his greatest downfall, pride. He was not content being a beautiful, anointed, wise, powerful 
angelic being, a guardian cherub anointed to, to lead out prestigiously even over many of the other angels. He wasn't content with that. And in his pride, which is incredible to think about the aspect of free will, it's incredible to think that not only did God give us free will, but he gave the angelic beings a, a, a sense of free will. And, and we'll talk more about the sovereignty of God a little bit as we go and how much free will do we really actually have. But in the midst of this, he sinned. In the midst of this, in, he made a conscious decision to desire to be worshipped. It was not enough for him. He wanted more. It's like the little mermaid. Yeah, think about us. I got 20, but who cares? I want more. It's a great movie to show girls, right? It's a great message. That's Satan, but who cares? I want more. I want more. I want to be worshipped. And that's why every false religion, every cult, and every person who doesn't believe there to be a God but believes himself God is ultimately worshipping Satan. That's what he wants is to steal the worship from God. That's all he ever wanted from the beginning. That's all he still wants to this day. He doesn't care what name you attribute him. He doesn't care what you call him. He doesn't care if you call him Allah. He doesn't care if you call him the Mormon Jesus. He doesn't care if you call him by the name Satan, Lucifer. He doesn't care if you go by the 330 million gods of Hinduism, Brahma, all the way through. He doesn't care what name you attribute him, even if it's your own name. He doesn't care because that's all he wants. He wants worship and he wants to steal it because we were created to worship and so he wants to steal the worship of God to steal kill and destroy revelation 12 reveals this idea where do we get this idea that a third of the angelic army fell that it wasn't just satan but where do we get this idea that a third of the angelic army fell it comes from revelation 12 3 through 4 and 7 through 9 then another sign appeared in heaven. There was a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. We know that goes back to the book of Daniel, right? And on its heads were seven crowns. Its tails swept away a third of the stars in heaven and hurled them to the earth. And the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that when she did give birth, it might devour her child. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels also fought, but he could not prevail, and there was no place for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the one who deceives the whole world. He was thrown to earth and his angels with him. And there is so much going on here about the ebb and flowing of, it's interesting, when you think about the timeline of God, it is not linear. God sees everything holistically. And so even in the midst of this prophecy, it's like it ebbs and flows from creation to even Mary and whenever King Herod would come against Jesus when he's born. And then it goes back to the battle again in the cosmic realm, even before, because we know that the serpent is already in the garden. He's already fallen. And yet, it, so it's going back back and forth. And then it's going back to the end where he's going to be completely cast into the fiery pit. And so it's very interesting to even just follow that because if you try to follow that in like a chronological point, you're super confused about when this took place. And so you got to understand that the omniscient God can see everything as if it is that. That's hard because we're linear. It's like he saw the beginning and the middle and the end and he could speak of it as if it happened right now. And but here's the here's what's so complicated about all this is God is sovereign, meaning God is fully in control. And God can do what he desires that are in accordance to who he is, his attributes, right? So God can do these things. So then the question becomes, we know, and the question is why, does God allow Satan to do what he does? Because we know, we know through scriptures. That God has given Satan power. He's allowed it. Right? And he's allowed him to be known as a ruler of this world. The earth. And that's a complicated thing to understand. Because God is over all. And, and Jesus' son is over all. And the Holy Spirit is over all. And yet it, this domain, this earth, in some sense, has been given over 
to Satan in some capacity. And that's a struggle. Why allow that? Because Scripture has this to say about his ruling. John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Ephesians 2, 1 through 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked according to the ways of the world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4. But if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. In Colossians 1, 13, he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves. And so we just keep looking at that going, okay, but why? Why does he allow that? Why has he granted that to exist? And we have to be careful with that question, right? We have to be so careful with our why questions. But what we can see is the sovereignty of God in the midst of this. Because we also are shown that he can't operate without permission. And he can't operate outside of the parameters that God has given him. And so... In God's sovereignty, in his control, he is still overall, but cannot cause evil. He gave free will. Free will led to sin. And so in the midst of that, Satan, angelic beings, and us all sinned. And yet God is still over all things and still has everything perfectly under control. We see this in Philippians 2, 10 through 11, so that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow Who is every knee? Well, that's every knee. In heaven, on earth, under the earth. That's every being. Every being will bow at the name of Jesus. That doesn't mean worship. There's going to be a time, the second advent, and Jesus returns, and everyone will know. This is the finality. And everyone will know. He was the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That does not mean that all of them who now know this are saved. He's not coming the second time to bring salvation, but judgment. And what does it mean to call him God of this age? It means he's got power, but again, only the power that God and our fleshly nature give him. And we can see this permission because there's that interesting exchange that we're all aware of in Job. And the only part of this aspect of Job I want to look at is just the conversation. And in this conversation, we see, and this, it doesn't matter how many times we started this, how many, th- how many times we think we understand this? It's always going to baffle us in some capacity. It says, one day, this is verse 6, one day the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Okay, so the sons of God, who are they? Angels, right? Angelic beings. But that also could mean demonic spirits. Because it says, before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord asked Satan, where have you come from? From roaming through the earth, Satan answered him. And walking around in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity, who fears God and turns away from evil. Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Haven't you placed a hedge around him, his household, and everything he owns? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and have increased his land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he owns, and he will surely curse you face to face. Very well, the Lord said to Satan, everything he owns is in your power. However, do not lay a hand on Job himself. So Satan left the Lord's presence. And one day when Job's sons and daughters were eating and drinking, their oldest was attacked. And then it spirals from there. It's an interesting exchange because at this point, it was still allowed. We don't see this kind of exchange anywhere else, but at this point it was still allowed and Satan's having a conversation with God. And it's interesting too that even Satan says the words, but you strike him, but you do these things. So even in that, Satan was attributing that you're going to have to grant permission. You're going to have to allow these things. There's also those interesting moments in Scripture where it looks like God is doing something that looks like it's attributed to evil, but it's not. It's because of the allowance of what he's letting Satan do. This is one of those moments. He's like, but you strike him. You've blessed him. You put a hedge of protection around him. He's not cursing you because he's living large. 
Strike him down. He'll curse you. And in this exchange, under the parameters and the allowance of God, he allows Satan to come against Job and his household. But he gave clearly defined parameters. And then the conversation gets revisited later. But what this says, this interesting exchange says this, that nothing, Satan can't do anything without permission. So we know his power is limited. We know his capacity is limited. But yet we're going to struggle with that because we are constantly privy to horrific things in this world. We are privy to sheer evil. We know it's there. We see it happen. Families impacted. Life's lost. That case right now in the news, just go read it. It is horrific. It's horrific. And it leads us to that place going, why? It will lead us to a place. Any of us going through these things or witnessing these things, witnessing the atrocities of mankind, the question is why? Why would Satan be allowed to do this? And that is where we must caution because this is so difficult and there's so much tension and we must balance that conversation. Anytime we ask God why, it's got to be with a heart of earnestness, a heart of God, I love you. God, I trust you. But I don't understand what's happening right now. Because what we must ask ourselves is this. If we're asking the question, why does Satan have free will? Why is he allowed to do what he's allowed to do? Then the question comes back to us. Why are we given free will? Why are we allowed to do what we're allowed to do? And then the other question we ultimately must land on is, do we trust in the sovereignty and goodness of God? Because if we trust in the sovereignty and goodness of God, we can trust his plan. We can trust how he orchestrates things, what he allows and what he doesn't allow, what he prevents and what he doesn't prevent. Because if we truly believe that God is fully in control, and if we understand that in the midst of that he has limited the capacity of control because he could have made us all robots right he did not have to give free will so he even limited his control in some capacity by even just giving us the freedom to make some decisions and he's going to hold us responsible and accountable to those decisions so we know that in that somewhere that we're not not robots or he couldn't be a just god so we are capable of making these horrific decisions the question is, is why did god allow any of that to begin with And so we just got to press in and trust in the sovereignty and goodness of God and keep coming back to him and keep coming back to him and keep pressing into him because ultimately we know that he can make good of all things. And we know that the gospel is illuminated because of it. We know that the work of Jesus Christ is illuminated because of it. We know that God is glorified in the manner in which that he redeems and restores his creation in the midst of all of our horrific decisions. If we ever ask the question, why does God allow that? The other question we're asking is, why is God granting mercy to them? Why doesn't God just finish them off right now? That question will always come back to the mirror. Why did God give me mercy? Why did God grant me mercy for so long? Why was God so patient with me until I came to him? Because the fact is, is the wages of sin is death. That's immediate. The consequences for the wages of sin is death. That's immediate. The moment we sinned, death was the consequence. That's a spiritual death. Could be culminated as well with the physical death. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. And so we have to weigh this in balance going, God is allowing these things, but are we really going to attack his mercy? Are we really going to attack his sovereignty? Are we really going to attack his goodness? Are we really going to attack his love? Are we really going to attack his just nature? Are we really going to attack that it says in scripture that he is patiently waiting for us to come to him? And tragically, in the midst of that waiting, we do horrific things to each other. And there's a balance in what God is going to allow and not allow because he is over all things, but he is still giving us a really long leash. That's tough. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. The Lord, this is the Lord's declaration. For as heaven is higher than the earth, so my ways 
are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Revelation 4.11 says, O Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things and by your will they exist and were created. That's everything. By his will, everything exists. That's the supernatural realm, the spiritual realm. That's the physical realm. That's us. That's the angelic beings. That's Satan and the demonic forces. The demonic beings, right? He created all things, and by his will, they exist. The fact is, as we know, Satan is a fallen angel, but that's not how he was. He was not created evil. He was created with the capacity to commit evil just as us. And he did. And so we've got to trust in the sovereignty of God. Can we turn the question to, can God's glory be revealed to us and be magnified in this world of suffering? Because we know that every single time we succumb to the schemes of the evil one, there's suffering in this world. But can God's glory be revealed in suffering? Absolutely. Scripture tells us it is. In Philippians 1.20 says, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Christ will be highly honored in our bodies. Christ will be highly, highly honored no matter what takes place in this world. But we're going to try to unpack a lot of this stuff along the way. We're going to try to unpack how he comes after us with the power that he's been given. But we've got to keep it in balance. And we've just got to remember throughout this whole conversation, he's simply a created being. He's not God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, Lord, in the weight of this, and a lot of times when we get back to just looking at what is allowed in this world and what takes place in this world, we know that it has sucked the faith away from so many. We know that it has caused some to walk away. We know it has, it has caused others to never pursue you. But Father, as we sit in this room today, we can recognize who you are. We can recognize that you are the God of love, and as the all-knowing, all-powerful creator of all things, we know that under your control, under your sovereignty, you have allowed things that we will never understand. But Father, even if we try to take this to unhealthy places, even if we try to take it there, Lord, you still have mercy on us. And you demonstrate yourself to us. And you pursue us. And you draw near to us. And you have answers to the hard questions. You are patient with us and you are gentle with us throughout this process. And Father, I just pray that we bring these questions to you, but we bring them in a manner of a heart that is simply seeking you and that we can rest with the answers that we know and that we don't know. That as we traverse this fallen world, may we rest in the fact that we know that you are the God overall the God who loves us, and the God who sent his one and only son to pursue us, to die on the cross for us so that we can have a relationship with you. And we know the end of the story is that one day we will get to live in that world we all so dream of, that world where there is no more pain, sorrow, or suffering, or evil. And as we sit in your presence and as we worship you in your presence in a place of your new creation, your new heaven and new earth. Father, we rejoice in knowing that you will restore what this world has consumed. You will restore the proper relationship with us that you created from the beginning. And Father, all we have to do to enjoy that is to simply call on the name of your son. So may we study your word. May we study you, but may we rest in the hope that we know that you are over all things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.